Okay, I'd like to welcome our next presenter to the stage, William Nicewanger. Uh, William attends San Diego State University and was mentored this summer by Jonathan Martinez and Chris Davis. William's uh, oral presentation title is Identifying Relationships Between Precipitation Footprints and the Size and Intensity of Tropical Cyclones and Aquaplanet Simulations. And just to give you a heads up, I wore my hurricane socks today for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Hello everyone, like Jerry said, my name is William Nicewanger. I am a Nessie uh, intern and my mentors are John Martinez and Chris Davis. Uh, today I would like to talk to you about our research identifying the relationships between precipitation footprints and the size and intensity of tropical cyclones in aquaplanet simulations. Tropical cyclones are the most destructive and costly severe weather event that nature has to offer. The hazards associated with these tropical cyclones include freshwater flooding, storm surges, and severe winds carrying debris. Uh, over the last uh, 40 plus years, there have been over eight and a half thousand deaths and a trillion dollars in damages in the US alone. Um, if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that over 80% of the uh, fatalities associated with Atlantic tropical cyclones are from water hazards. And this led us to investigate the precipitation footprints of tropical cyclones. So um, the preparation and evacuation decisions that are needed are mostly driven by the size and intensity of tropical cyclones. But these quantities have been historically uh, difficult to predict due to the complexity of the multi-scale processes um, that control uh, or influence intensification and expansion. So our, uh, our research you know, wanted to know whether the size and intensity of tropical cyclones can be related to the area average rain rates and uh, based on the diabatic heating that is released during precipitation. So this relates to the uh, convergence of absolute angular momentum in these tropical cyclones, which is similar to the spinning ice, uh, ice skater. So the diabatic heating creates uh, uh, or you know, adds to the lower pressure and then uh, the convergence of absolute angular momentum increases and the cyclone actually spins up faster and faster. So we studied these uh, questions in an idealized aquaplanet simulation using the model for prediction across scales atmosphere or MPAS A. So it's a, the model had a zonally symmetric uh, sea surface temperatures at a 30 kilometer grid spacing it used, it included the Diona cycle and the cloud radiative feedbacks along with the other basic physical properties of the models. Um, in our simulations, there was no land, there's no seasons, and there's no sea ice. So it's, uh, it removes the variabil internal variability while retaining all the ingredients necessary to create convergence and more importantly, tropical cyclones. Uh, our uh, simulation ran for three years and it produced 714 tropical cyclone events and they all had about two week lifespans or up to two week lifespans. So here's a visualization of, our, of the outgoing long wave radiation for a 20 day period. As you can see above the equator in the intertropical convergence zone, you can see small tropical cyclones forming and spinning up. On the right, you can see the rain rates for a single tropical cyclone over a two week time span. Here, the tropical cyclone begins to organize and actually tightens its, up, its core and then the, the uh, rain rates are, get really high in that inner core region. So actually going back and looking at that left graph uh, or visualization, um, you can see that more than just tropical cyclones are being created. So how do we determine what is a tropical cyclone in this? We use the track algorithm, which looks for vorticity at the surface, vertical coherence, and then a warm core criteria, which just means that the vorticity uh, weakens as it goes aloft. We also look for a dropping uh, minimum sea level pressure for 24 hours prior to uh, cyclogenesis. And then finally, a closed 
uh, isobar of uh, minimum sea level pressure surrounding the tropical cyclone center and within a five degree radius. So we've talked about the motivations, the, um, our hypothesis and our methods, but it's really important to describe the variables that we are talking about when we're talking about um, precipitation footprint size and intensity. So we use, uh, for precipitation footprints, we're looking at the area average rain rates, and we further split this into two regions. An inner core region, which is the innermost 200 kilometers of the tropical cyclone, and an outer core region, which is the 200 to 600 kilometers of the tropical cyclone. When we're talking about size, we look at the radius of tangential winds equal to eight meters per second, um, or an R8. An R8 is very important for us because it distinguishes the tropical cyclone winds from the environmental winds, and thus kind of defines a tropical cyclone for us in our study. And then for intensity, we're looking at the maximum winds 10 meters above the surface. Um, this is the same definition that's used by the National Weather Service to categorize uh, hurricanes and um, using the saffir simpson scale. So I'm just gonna go over some summary statistics of our variables real quick. Um, so our inner core rain rates, the highest rain rates are occurring in that eyewall region of the tropical cyclone. Um, the, in our uh, composites, it's from zero to 10 millimeters per hour, and which is much larger than the outer core rain rates, which range from zero to 2.5 millimeters per hour, but that covers a much larger extent. That's like your spiraling uh, rain bands. All right, when we're looking at size, the size of these tropical cyclones vary, just like they do in nature. Um, they range from about a hundred, like orders of 100 to 1,000 kilometers, and some reached our maximum extent of our study, which was uh, 1,200 kilometers. And then uh, most tropical cyclones reached a maximum size of about 650 kilometers. So our inner core and our outer core kind of work really well for these, this study. Now, this 498 tropical cyclones that reach a measurable aid R8 value, this is very important because these are the only events that we're using in our study. We're, we're, we're taking out everything else that didn't fall in that. When we're looking at maximum wind, or maximum wind speeds, they range from eight to 45 meters per second. Uh, it is well known that the highest winds occur in the eye wall. Uh, most of the storms reached about 20 meters per second, which categorizes them as a tropical storm. Uh, again, this is typical to what we see in nature. Uh, but most of the, uh, the most powerful storms that these models produced were only category two. And this is probably due to the 30 kilometer grid spacing. It doesn't allow for the fine, um, I guess the, uh, the mechanisms that intensify further. So here we have a uh, composite evolution of the rain rates and size. As you can tell, there's a lot of uh, variability between them but with like large standard deviations, but they follow a very similar pattern. And here's the same thing, but with maximum wind speeds. Now these plots really helped us uh, focus on the relationships between these variables. And so when we wanted to test the significance and the correlations between our results, we used linear regressions in the student's t-test. Uh, right there we have the equation, where R is the Pearson correlation coefficient and N is the number of samples, in our case 498, that reached an R8 value. Our, our null hypothesis is that there was no uh, significant linear relationship between these variables. While testing at the 99% confidence level, um, we, if the T statistic is larger than the critical T value, which is given by that confidence interval and your, um, your degrees of freedom, which is uh, N minus two, um, then if that statistic was larger, then we can reject the null hypothesis with high confidence and assume significant correlations between the two samples. So we'll go on to the results here. The inner core rain rates in R8 here and the outer core rain rates in R8 um, on the right. So both the inner core and outer core have, are very correlated with size with an R value of 0.28 and 0.31 respectively. They also have very small P values which you know, tell you the significance of these uh, correlations. 
Um, and now looking at rain rates versus intensity with the same inner core on the left, outer core on the right, you can see that there is a very heavy correlation between inner core and rain rates in maximum intensity. And with an R value of 0 0.8 and a uh, P value that is just incredibly small, uh, we can say with uh, very high confidence that those are correlated. When you look at the outer core rain rates, there's no correlation at all. Um, so we're just gonna move right on to the conclusions. Our results confirm that there is a linear relationship between the area average rain rates and both the size and intensity of tropical cyclones in these aquaplanet simulations. And our findings indicate that remote sensing observations of rain rates could aid in predicting the size and intensity of land falling tropical cyclones and further mitigate those fatalities and damage. So some of the future work that I would like to do, during my literature review process, I found out that there's, a, there's so many variables that these tropical cyclones uh, have and that relate to size and intensity. And so I would like to explore some of these further in these aquaplant simulations to include the environmental humidity, the upper level divergence and the vertical wind shear, because it, it was shown in some other papers that those had really good significance to size. Um, I also would like to investigate whether these relationships existed in satellite observations. And if so, this has huge implications for tropical cyclone forecasting. And finally, um, this was just one like, series of simulations at a 30 kilometer resolution. Like we said, these tropical cyclones couldn't intensify past category two. So um, I would like to look at these simulations in 15 kilometer resolution, similar to the numerical weather prediction, and even 120 kilometer resolution to look at like uh, general circulation model size and compare these results. I wanna thank my mentors for all the guidance. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you all for you know, helping support me throughout this research. Any questions at this time? Uh, once again, for those of you joining us online, if you'd like to ask Will a question, you, question, you can do so through the Slido feature. And do we have any questions from the audience? Thanks, Will, that was very nice. Um, so I wanted to ask about the aqua planet simulation. Um, okay. Do you think that there is any variables that you might be missing out on by having, by missing out on things like land features and maybe, I mean, I don't know much about, you know, ocean dynamics, but land features and currents that might be present in the real world that are not in your simulations? 100% Fletcher. Uh, there are definitely variables that we are missing um, that contribute to you know the amount of rainfall that is actually occurring because when these uh, storms kind of go over land, you know you have orographic lifting. Um, so yes, but that is why this is an idealized framework so that we kind of can understand these uh, mechanisms in a more simplified scale. Um, and that's why I would like to see if these work in like satellite observations. but you know, as a model, there is there are things that we're missing because we just don't know exactly how all of these um, processes le like work together. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, good question. I mean, hey, Will. Nice talk. Um, my question is: You mentioned the end of satellite observations. I wonder what parameters we're looking at when we want to identify cyclones in satellite observation. So you say you want to use rain rate to infer the intensity and that stuff. So we're seeing from satellite. Yeah. So for satellite uh, image for satellite observations, we have uh, trim data that we could look at for rain rates, uh, tropical rain rates. Um, now size and intensity are really hard to determine with uh, satellite observations. Uh, we are getting there. I believe that there are uh, wind. Like there's like wind vectors that we could look at for satellite observations. Um, and then using a size, uh, I think, I know that it would be difficult to do this study, but I think it's worthwhile. And I've talked to a, I've talked to a few scientists uh, about, you know, moving forward with this. So 
I, I don't have the exact data sets that I would like to look at yet, but that's part of the you know research process. Awesome. Great presentation, Will. I was just curious, what was the most surprising thing you learned throughout the, this research? Mm. I mean, I think the most pr surprising thing actually has nothing to do with my data. It was the fact that I could do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, awesome. No, but uh, I would say, you know, that that correlation between uh, maximum intensity and intercore rain rates, I mean, that's, pre that's a lot higher than we would assume. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that's, that's got to be the most uh, significant. Um, and then, like, we were assuming that outer core rain rates would actually have more influence on the R8 value, the size. Um, and it has, you know, it has a pretty good correlation. There's just so many different processes that are going. But we assumed kind of more correlation than the inner core rain rate, like a significant more. Um, and it was a, just a little bit like a higher correlation. So those are probably the, the most interesting findings. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Check online. Jerry, I know you have a question. You got hurricane socks on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to check our time. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and take a break. I'm going to let you off the hook from question for me. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and take a break until 2.40, and then our graduate students will jump in with their presentations, uh, and Ben will be kicking that off. So we'll see you at 2.40. Thank you so much, Will.